Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, the podcast where we talk to the change agents making Tulsa and Oklahoma a more resilient place. I am your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And today our guest is Chris Bernard, the executive director of Hunger Free Oklahoma and Tulsa Kitchens Unite. We talked to Chris about food insecurity in Oklahoma and how connecting people to existing resources can make a profound impact. He also talked about Tulsa Kitchens United and how it is keeping people employed while feeding people in need. And we talk about how we can all help today and in the future to combat food insecurity. We also discover Chris's love and his children's love for all things X-Men and Marvel. Enjoy. All right, we are very excited to have Chris Bernard, the executive director of Hunger Free Oklahoma, on the podcast today. Hi, Chris. Hi. So, first question: How you doing? I'm all right, man. I'm uh. So this is normally the time. I guess people won't know what time it is. It's five thirty. So this is the time where I kind of start what I'm calling my second job right now, which is my normal job. Most of the the regular work day for me is this new project we've taken on during COVID-19. Can you tell us about that new project? Sure. So it's called Tulsa Kitchens Unite. And it is, it's a direct service project, which is not normal for us. We're not normally a direct service organization. But what we do do is kind of identify gaps and respond to them as best we can in times of crisis. So we did it during the teacher walkout in Oklahoma and sort of helped organize meal sites in Tulsa. And as the coronavirus was starting, it was starting to be clear it was going to have a real impact. We saw a gap in that there was huge kitchen capacity in restaurants and other kitchens that were shutting down because of the virus. There was growing need in food insecurity, and the more of those folks who worked for the restaurants who got laid off or furloughed, the more the need would grow. We wrote a proposal and submitted it to some funders to run a program where we paid restaurants to produce meals to help build the capacity of our partner organizations to address food insecurity. So we right now are in, I think, our sixth week of operation. Yes, we are in our sixth week. We're producing 32,000 meals a week, working with 23 different restaurants, distributing at over 60 different sites every week, the majority of those being Tulsa Public Schools meal sites. So they can feed kids, they can serve breakfast and lunch, and that's reimbursed from the USDA, but they can't feed the parents they can't do weekend meals and dinners. So our meals are designed to kind of fill that gap. And they're frozen meals. They're prepared by the restaurants and frozen so that families can really be empowered to use them whenever they need it, right? Rather than a hot meal that they'd have to eat in the next few days or else, you know, risking food poisoning or otherwise. So it's going well, but it's a lot of logistics, right? So that many sites with that many restaurants, we use nine transport vehicles run by different partners, one of which is driven by me. We have to run supplies like bags and boxes. And today we were running, I bought 18 canopy tents because it might rain. So we were distributing tents to all of our sites that were handing out meals today. So that's what I spend my day doing and kind of troubleshooting because there's a new, the way this crisis has evolved, you kind of have to adapt your program every week you know, because maybe more of your volunteers are going back to work. So you got to figure out a new way to staff your sites because we use 70 volunteers a day to do this. Or maybe some of your restaurant partners capacity is lower because they had to open up. You know, we're using National Guard right now. They're going to go away in a couple weeks probably because the emergency won't be viewed as so crucial that they need to be activated and they need to go back to their regular jobs. So it's it's constant kind of tweaking and adjusting. So it's one of those, when, you know, there's many conversations happening about how, how states reopen and, you know, whether those policies match up with the science or not, all those kind of conversations. But there was, yeah. 
what you just brought up is an angle of it I hadn't thought about before, which is as this emergency no longer is categorized as an emergency, you and Tulsa Kitchens Unite lose resources you were using during the emergency. Oh, absolutely. Right. So we designed a program to operate while a lot of things were shut down. And so what we were able to utilize was a lot of capacity that all of a sudden couldn't be used. And now that business is opening back up generally, right, a lot of that capacity needs to go back to those partners, normal business. So even we source all the product for the restaurants and all the to-go containers, and we use a restaurant supplier to distribute that product. They all of a sudden have normal orders going on. Right. So they were delivering all our meals, all our product on Fridays that had to move to Thursdays. Our restaurants, now that they're open, picking up meals in the middle of their lunch rush hour doesn't make sense. Right. So we're, we'll have to shift the way we do some of that. Yeah. Every, every change that happens in terms of opening back up or restricting more. Right. We had a plan for if literally people couldn't leave their houses and how would we start to do home deliveries. I'm not going to say that plan was fully developed, but that's really where we thought we'd be going first. Mm -hmm. And now we've had to shift to say, well, that's not it. It's really about how do we now either pay for things that we were getting for free because all of a sudden people aren't just free to, you know, volunteer in the middle of the day or vans aren't sitting idle. They're actually having to deliver things. So we got to pay for vehicles. Or how do we adjust our entire model to now accommodate the restricted sort of free capacity that existed for about a month? Is there an opportunity for some version of this program to be semi-permanent, to continue to use some excess capacity, excess food, things like that from restaurants? So I think yes. I don't think my organization will run it long term. So we we have done, we have another program that we've taken over, not like a hostile takeover. We took <laughs> on from an organization um, called Double Up Oklahoma that was really before this the closest thing to direct service. And the way we view anything we do in that arena is our job is to stand it up and create a model that made sense for someone else to take. So kind of the beauty of us, because we're not direct service, we actually have a pretty lean budget because it's all just people, right? Mm -hmm. But we also, our work is all about capacity building, policy, advocacy, and you can do that through lots of different means. And so we're very flexible. And so we can take much larger risks than an established nonprofit that's already built out these programs. So we kind of view it as our role to take the risk, see if something will work, and then hopefully get somebody to see it as viable. At the scale we're doing it, probably not, right? The need is huge right now. If you look at national studies, food insecurity doubled across the country, and particularly for families with children in the home. And so if you take that number and apply it to Oklahoma, that would make one in every like 2.3 kids food insecure, one in every three households. And that'll start to ease some, but not completely because mm-hmm. things like the ho- the hotel industry, the healthcare industry, thing that relied on big crowds gathering, none of those things are coming back quick, right? And so there's going to be a lot of people who are still struggling and a lot of people who kind of went into a hole during this crisis and are going to have to dig out for a long time. So I do think there's opportunity there to use the kitchen capacity that exists in the service industry to help the food insecurity world. But I, operating it at this scale all the time, I don't think any of the partners would have the capacity to do. And if you wanted to make it full cost, like one of the reasons it was an efficient program is because it just there was lots of in-kind contribution that right. won't, won't be there in the future. So when you're when you're not working on a specific crisis like this, what yeah. does your organization look like? What are your 
kind of your, your mission, your goals and. Yeah. It. So our, our mission is to leverage the power of collaboration to transform systems, practices, and policies to create a hunger free Oklahoma, right? Like the name says what that really means in reality, we focus a lot on the federal nutrition programs. So that would include SNAP, which most people call food stamps, WIC, which is uh, similar to a food stamp model, but focused on pregnant moms and young children. Then the child nutrition programs, which is like your school breakfast, lunch, after school meals, and summer meals. And the reason we focus on those programs is because as they are the largest resource to address food insecurity by far. And we as a state are not particularly great at drawing them down. So when we launched three and a half years ago, we launched with a study that showed if we just hit marks of participation in those programs. And when I'm talking about participation, I'm talking about the number of people who are eligible for the programs accessing the programs. If we hit marks that other states have hit, we would be drawing down an additional $400 million to our state to address food insecurity each year. Wow. And those are dollars that stimulate our economy, right? They create jobs mm -hmm. and they help feed people. So they're in a way they're both preventing food insecurity from growing by keeping others employed while helping feed people. So very similar to what I'm talking about with Tulsa kitchens unite. Mm -hmm. right? And so we do, advocacy work at the federal, state, and local levels around those programs, removing barriers. We do a ton of capacity building, both with government partners, whether it be school districts or government agencies and community-based organizations to help them utilize those programs and get the folks who need them accessing them as much as possible. And to us, that means getting the programs to the people rather than making the people come to the programs. Right. I'll often talk about being in poverty as like being a full time job because every resource wants you to come to them. They want you to fill out five, you know, pieces of paperwork and prove that you somehow deserve it. And if you're hopping around accessing each one of those resources, you're spending a ton of time and you already have limited resources. You have limited access to transportation and other things that make that even harder for you. So as best we can, getting those resources to the communities and the people that need them with the least amount of hassle. We also do a lot of public-private partnership work. So there are things that government is good at and not good at. Outreach um, and customer service are not historically government strong suits, right? So we train school districts and others how to talk to families about SNAP and help them enroll and actually Next week, we'll roll out our next COVID response uh, program, which is we're standing up a statewide hotline to walk people through the SNAP enrollment process. So we got funded last week. Um, we built the infrastructure this week, thanks to 211 helping mm -hmm. us out, helping us leverage some stuff. And we're training operators starting tomorrow. Wow. Actually, my the two others in my leadership team are setting up 20 laptops right now in the other room, getting it ready. And Six so feet apart, I assume, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. All wearing that. We have a really big conference room, so they're on two ends of the table. Well, uh, yeah. I, I want to ask you this because I feel like this is important because people, you know, humans are very adaptable and we sort of move from problem to problem. But, you know, food insecurity and hunger were, were already a problem before the coronavirus in Oklahoma, especially, can you sort of, you sort of mentioned some numbers earlier, but yeah, yeah what were the numbers when things were going well here? Okay. I put well, uh, sure. for people, for, for, <laughs> for our, our viewers not watching, I just did air quotes. So yeah, we are one of, we have some of the worst hunger stats in the country and it's one in six households in Oklahoma are food insecure. One in about 4.5 children in Oklahoma are food insecure, around one in 10 seniors but we also have some of the worst participation rates in some of these programs. Others were doing all right, but we're the worst in summer meals. So only around 4.7% of kids who access free and reduced lunch in the school year, right? So those families rely on that free resource, access a summer meal in the summer. 
which is also a free meal offered, but has a lot of requirements. You have to get to the site that it's at, right? Which when you're going to school, that's easy. You're there. When a parent's told you got to drive 15 miles because we don't run buses to go get a summer meal, that's a harder thing to access. Mm -hmm. Hunger costs our state around 1.4 billion a year, and that's in additional healthcare costs. That's in loss in productivity because folks who aren't getting enough food, their immune systems weaken, they're calling in sick, their kids are getting sick, and often if you're food insecure, you're probably an hourly worker. So you're you either have to stay home with your child under 12 or have DHS called on you, right? So you're going to lose earning power those sorts of things. I won't pretend to understand the whole algorithm, but those sorts of impacts. And it's, I mean, the reason it's so important, and I'm sure we'll get to later about like why I was inspired to do the work, but that was my next um, question. So. <laughs> the foundational issue, right? So hunger impacts, academic outcomes, test scores, impacts long-term health outcomes, long-term earning outcomes, overall it's one of those issues that if we address it, everything else is going to look better. One question just before we jump into a little bit of the why, um, when you talk about participation rates, one of the things that I'm sure I should have known but didn't until this recent crisis is that you know, there are whole segments of the population that didn't sign up for unemployment, even though yes. they were, they could qualify. A lot of them were immigrants to this country, even documented, not yeah. undocumented, but because of their general yeah. distrust of the government, even money that they've earned and effectively paid into with their taxes, they wouldn't sign up. I mean, is there some crossover with, with <laughs> these programs as well? Oh, so much. So something we've been advocating pretty strongly on actually organized an entirely different branded coalition is a rule called public charge that basically said, if you're trying to become a citizen and you've accessed one of X programs, SNAP being one of them, we will use that as a negative factor in determining whether you should be a citizen. Now, the irony of that is most people who are trying to get citizenship aren't even eligible for SNAP, right? But their kids might be if you mm -hmm. have citizenship kids, for instance. So the rule, I mean, really impacts a small number of people, but creates fear in a massive number of people. Right. You add to that a lot more aggressive action by ICE and other things. And so you had in immigrant communities not wanting to go to the meal sites because they're congregate. Your kid has to eat there. A lot of people pulled out of SNAP, WIC, other programs that really they were making a choice to you know, sacrifice their family's health and nutrition out of fear of how it would impact them in the future. And we've seen since that rule got proposed, not even passed, participation rates started to go down in some of this stuff. And so a really powerful tool is just community education. So we've done a lot of training for sort of community leaders in immigrant communities to talk to them about the program and train them about you know, what these new rules do and don't mean and who they impact and who they don't. So we kind of did a campaign about if you don't meet one of these five categories, which are all very narrow, don't worry about this rule. Keep accessing the programs you need to feed your family, right? Mm -hmm. Or to get healthcare or whatever else. If you fall into one of these five categories, talk to a lawyer. But we also have a lot of shame in Oklahoma, so not just immigrant communities, right? It's true. People, people conceive these programs as, if I take it, I'm taking it away from someone else who needs it, which is not true, right? It's the nature of the programs is they expand and contract as need does, and they're funded that way. People think that if other people see that they're a part of this program, they'll be judged. And so a lot of our work is also reducing stigma. So you talked about, even though they've paid into the program, I often talk about these programs as insurance, right? You have paid into it precisely mm -hmm. because it's there for families or individuals when they're in crisis. And so it's no different than health insurance or car insurance or anything else. You're paying into it with the understanding that when you need it, it'll be there for you. 
So it's really hunger insurance rather than people thinking of it as welfare. Yeah, right. And I mean, that's really what all quote unquote welfare programs are, right? It, it helps you get back on your feet when you need it. So you become a earning citizen who's paying taxes and then you're paying back into the program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been unfortunate that all that stuff has been politicized and framed in the wrong way. Like you look at SNAP, SNAP is historically bipartisan. Bob Dole was one of the first champions of SNAP, right? And it has, it even still, because it's in the farm bill, tends to be more bipartisan than some of the other ones, but it it's getting politicized more and more and more rules, mm -hmm. administrative rules attacking it and trying to force people off of it are have been happening in the last few years. I mean, it, it ties, it ties back into one of my favorite hobby horses about how the American government can't change its definition of what poverty is. And so all of these new programs have to do some crazy math with the poverty line to include things that aren't technically people who aren't technically in poverty, but are because they haven't changed it in 30 years. Yeah. And it's, it's ridiculous when you're like, Oh, someone 175% above the poverty line. I'm like, why don't we just change it? If change that's poverty. Yeah. Line. Yeah. Cause you know, inflation happens. We all know this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that there's the challenge of the, the cliff, right? So snaps 130% of the poverty line, you go to 131 you're off snap completely, but your earnings are actually less than if you just stayed on snap. Right. And I think, there needs to be a lot of public education. People think, you know, folks are getting rich off me with SNAP. The maximum benefit for SNAP for an individual is like $184. Most people are significantly under that. It doesn't pay even for all your food for the month, let alone like make you rich, right? And that's true of all these programs. They are all supplemental. They are designed to help you stretch your budget a little further and make sure you have basic needs met. So you can think about instead of where's my next meal going to come from, you can think about, hey, maybe I should access that workforce program so I could earn some more money. And or maybe, you know, I'm not so stressed about where, how I'm going to feed my kids. I can sit down with them and have some quality time, which, you know, a positive relationship with a caring adult is a huge protective factor for a kid in poverty who has all these other risk factors around them. So, yeah. So I, mean, I think, I help, yeah. oh, well, ahead, I was going to say, Jesse, I think, I think we should probably ask the, the, the question that you were going to ask, which is what, what did bring you to this? I mean, you're clearly very passionate about it. So what brought you to it and, and why are you so passionate about it? So how much time do we have? <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of long winded. Not like us. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. I, I took a kind of roundabout way to it. I, I think I became kind of passionate about sort of just social justice and poverty issues at kind of a young age, like uh, 13 or so. So my parents got divorced. And I was a middle class kid. When my parents got divorced, my mother had, you know, dropped out of college to support my dad's education and stuff. So I, my mom did not have a lot of earning power and, you know, we, we weren't homeless or anything, but we did, we were resource strapped. We had to budget. We can remember like we had this car when my parents first got divorced that I could lift up the floor like rug mm -hmm. and drop things through the holes in the car floor and watch them like bounce behind me, <laughs> you know? And I moved from a pretty nice house by the school I went to, to a one bedroom apartment with my mom across the street. And so this, like, I, all of a sudden week to week was moving from kind of like haves to have nots. And then when I got to middle school, I went to school on the North side to Carver and then Booker T, which, you know, when I was growing up was kind of the only way, like a, a white kid from the South side or midtown of Tulsa saw the North side. And so then I started seeing other sort of inequalities with my friends who lived in that neighborhood and 
at the same time, my mom and I moved over near 61st and Peoria. So I was seeing like a pocket of that same inequality. And so I'd, it would just always kind of struck me how unfair it was like, you know, based on a circumstance that a kid can't help, there's access to resources is so drastically different. So went to college kind of as people were sort of surprised I went to college. I was kind of a rebel. And I, I, because of my friends and some struggles they had, started getting into um, public health advocacy around HIV and hepatitis C and harm reduction work. So needle exchange. And I was going to school in Texas and I was helping uh, run and fundraise and needle exchange and also working as a full-time volunteer advocating to make it more accessible in Texas. Doing that work made me realize if I was going to do policy, I should know the law. So I applied to law school and moved to Chicago, went to law school in Northwestern, took on a new kind of equality issue in criminal justice reform. I worked on wrongful convictions in law school and then moved to policy. And I worked me and one other guy ran a prison watchdog program. I ran the juvenile side. So I went to every juvenile prison detention center in the state of Illinois and did public reports and advocacy in the legislature around that. And then went to work for government for an executive elected official who ran on a racial equity criminal justice platform. And me and three other people ran that for her for five years. So it's Chicago politics, right? Very much trial by fire, mm-hmm. by any means necessary. So I did legislative work for government relations. It was a county government. So we ran the largest single site jail and detention center in the country. And our job was to shrink them. And so I ran programs. I gave out grants. I passed laws that ended the transfer of juveniles to adult courts in Illinois. We totally transformed juvenile probation. We raised the age of juvenile jurisdiction and did a lot of community work as well. And, you know, my wife is from here and we were kind of ready to come back home in this, uh, one of the local foundations in Tulsa, the Ann Henry Zero Foundation was talking to folks about starting this. And, you know, I sent my resume to someone and it somehow got to the right person who (laughs) sent it to them and they called me and said hey we're looking at doing this thing on food insecurity what do you think and we talked i told him my experience and we actually both mutually agreed that i was not a good fit for the job because i liked more controversial issues and i don't know maybe they thought i was a little too blunt but six months later they called me and said are you still looking i said if the right thing comes along And I did a Zoom interview, flew to Texas to look at an organization that operates kind of how Hunger Free does in this space of building public-private partnership, leveraging resources, knowing how to navigate government bureaucracy and helping communities do that to be more successful. And after meeting some of the people who did the work and talking about my experience and thinking about it, there was not a single kid I met in that Cook County Juvenile Detention Center or a juvenile prison or an adult prison or you know one of the the addicts or sex workers that I met when I was doing my harm reduction work who hadn't experienced food insecurity and likely had experienced it chronically right and if we had addressed that issue and maybe education inequality and maybe provided some other protective factors a lot of those people would not be in the situations that I met them in on the deep end. And so it just kind of clicked in me all of a sudden, if I can really address this problem and get to the root of it, right? And do it in a place like Oklahoma where these programs are, you say federal program and it's like a bad word, right? Mm -hmm. If we can start to change that and get people the support they need, maybe Oklahoma starts to have less brain drain and people stay here. Maybe, you know, our kids can be more successful in school and our educational outcomes will be better. And I don't know, it just, it became something that I said, I can do this and this is a challenge. And since I've been doing it for three and a half years, 
I'm not known as a very like outwardly emotional person. I'm pretty monotone and, you know, even keel, but I have found myself getting more and more emotional about it. And particularly when we have these moments where we're doing direct service, because we're usually one step removed, right? I don't actually see the people I'm helping. I see the organizations that I'm helping help those people. It's a really huge reminder that it is, I mean, shameful that we have kids who live six blocks, half a mile from my office who might not eat tonight unless charity stepped in, right? And that that shouldn't be, especially when there are these resources available where, you know, the programs that I advocate for could fill that gap and charity could do what it's really meant to do, which is respond to crisis. But we've built a system in Oklahoma where we accept, expect charity to solve all the problems. And government calls it a partnership, but it's really just government says, look at the great work they're doing. There is so much intersectionality between food insecurity and all these other social justice issues. Do you find yourself working with other organizations that focus on some of those other justice issues? Yes. And no, I, where our missions meet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a big believer in staying true to your mission because if you don't, you kind of water down your message. So we try and support other organizations where our missions meet. I'm also a huge believer that strategy matters and who's the right voice for the right cause. And any cause that you have somebody beating the drum and yelling in the face of someone, you also need an advocate behind the scenes working within the system to make change as well. And so depending on who is at the table and who is outside of the room, we will make different decisions. So public charge is a great example. That is not an issue I wanted us to be in the forefront of. I wanted us to be a supporter of another organization who is talking about immigrant rights, and we would bring our expertise on food insecurity to the table. As we started looking for that group, nobody really wanted to take it on. You know, they all said, yeah, we're concerned about it, but we don't have the capacity to run a coalition and push for it. So we did it. But we did it in a mindful way. We said, we'll be the backbone and offer the support. But our name shouldn't be tied to it because it waters down the message of what the impact of this is. So we created an entirely different coalition. It had its own website. We were one of the partners, right? And we offered our expertise, but so did everyone else to make that happen. And so I think you know, whatever my personal beliefs are as the head of an organization that needs to be effective in any political environment, right? We are nonpartisan. We are very careful and very strategic about what issues we attach ourselves to because what you'll hear at the Capitol or with decision makers is they stop listening to you once you bang on their door about everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, kind of talking about coalitions and other things, how, how do you make sure that you have all the right people at the table? I'm not sure you ever can. I, mm-hmm. I think that's really hard. Decisions about how big the table needs to be. So we do our best because a giant coalition beca- can become very unwieldy unless you have very specific rules set in place and agreements. We will often try and reach umbrella organizations that represent a much larger piece, right? So, for instance, we're the backbone organization for a coalition called the Oklahoma Child, I always get it wrong, Oklahoma Child Food Security Coalition, which was started because we're so bad at summer meals, but really focuses on child food insecurity across state. And we... We work with like the Oklahoma Association of YMCAs rather than each individual YMCA and the Boys and Girls Clubs Association of Oklahoma, the Library Association of Oklahoma. And we work with those groups and then they disseminate down the message, but also bring their members' concerns up to the coalition. 
if that makes sense. But you, if you're not doing it organically, I would say you're not doing it right. If you're relying only on your network and you're only inviting people you know to the table, then you are undoubtedly missing what is most likely the most marginalized communities in right. the place you work, right? So we very much, any partner we engage, we want them to bring us the partners they work with and to understand that landscape and are constantly trying to find new ways to engage communities that may not feel welcome. And it, it is a learning process for us. I think particularly in Oklahoma, diversity in an organization, but also in coalitions is a challenge because our marginalized communities have been so marginalized with very good reason. They are a little bit, you know, hesitant to trust. They've also been burnt so many times they'd rather kind of solve work together to solve their own problems. And so when we go to those communities, say tribal nations or the north side of Tulsa or the northeast side of Oklahoma City, we very much try and come from a place of here is what we do and we want to help you solve whatever issue you tell us you want to solve, but we are not going to come in and tell you what to do or come in with a solution and tell you this is how to solve your problem. And that takes time, right? So that's not quick change. Like trust building, grassroots coalition building takes a long time. And so our organization, we try and do it from both sides. So I'm more, if you look at my organization, how it's set up, I'm like the grass tops organizer. I'm building the relationships with government agencies, uh, leaders of organizations trying to bring them and say this is a big problem let's talk about the solutions and my what we call our program staff are doing more of the grassroots gathering information and feeding it up to me so i can say here's what we're hearing but also trying to build that coalition so hopefully we're working from the top down and the bottom up and we're going to meet in the middle and everyone not everyone's going to be on the exact same page, right? But there will be some commonalities that we can work together to address. And I'm using my hands a lot and realizing <laughs> I'm on a podcast. Listen, podcast <laughs> is a visual medium. We all know that. Yes, yeah. We, we, Chris and I have been saying that for years. <laughs> and you're, you're talking to a person who was raised by New York Jews. So I'm always hand talking on podcasts. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, go I ahead, I was just going to say, well, you mentioned that you do kind of the top down and bottom up. Earlier, you also mentioned that you need people working inside the system and outside the system. Do you do the same thing where you, you're you working both inside the system for change, but also working on the outside, outside of the system as well? Yeah. So even if you look at COVID-19 uh, response, a ton of our work from the relationships we've built with partnerships we have with Department of Human Services or the State Department of Education was working with them to say, these are the federal flexibilities that are coming down or that we know other states are doing based on the needs we see in Oklahoma, we think you should apply. Where do you need our help? If they would bring a problem to us, we'd say this waiver can solve that. And at the same time, we'd be hearing from our community partners what their biggest concerns were, their struggles, and we would help elevate that to the level of this needs to be a concern of a state agency, right? We are also, I mean, the nature of TKU is we're working with churches and community-based organizations and volunteers, but we're also having to do some high-level sort of funder and government work to make sure the program can last. We are looking at, you know, everyone is looking at the response I've built. Does it make sense for the response money that's come down? And would that make it last longer? Or... Should I really save that resource for someone else whose organization may not survive if they don't access it, right? And we have to, all of those decisions require sort of inside outside work. And I think I, I really understood, like, so as a teenager, I was a punk rock kid. So, you know, you write anarchy like on your hoodie <laughs> that you have patches on and stuff. And I never thought I'd work for government, but going into government and understanding how effective it can be if you understand how to navigate bureaucracy and rules. And the problem, I think, for most community-based agencies that are trying to solve the problem 
is they have no patience for that, right? Because it can be frustrating and defeating. So if we can be the ones who help them navigate that and bring those concerns up to help remove barriers, I think that's how we can be most effective and help them be most effective. So, you know, we always like to give our listeners ideas of how how they can help after they've heard about someone passionately talk about an issue. And you have the interesting position of answering this twofold, which is how can people help right now during the coronavirus pandemic, but also how can they help in general? Because this problem was here beforehand and this problem is going to be here afterwards. Yeah. And I have so many answers to that question. (laughs) Yes. um, Right now you can volunteer though. Lots of people want to volunteer, right? You could donate. The need is profound. So you talk to any of our partners who are doing like your, your normal model grocery giveaway kind of pantry. I, their, their demand has tripled 70% of the people coming are new, which means they've never been there before. So resources are crucial. And as business goes back up, the supply chain will get fixed. Right now they are getting massive amounts of donations from producers and suppliers because they had product they needed to get rid of because it couldn't go out in the chain. That's going to stop being true and monetary resources are going to be needed even more so. I also think just being mindful, like the buy local thing is more powerful than you think, right? So you are supporting local jobs, but it doesn't have to be, local doesn't have to mean it has to be a business owner, you know, in your community, even going to like a grocery chain is supporting local jobs. So, you know, not everyone can afford to go to the fancy bodega, but as long as you're trying to make sure, you know, your money's flowing into your local economy, I think that's helpful. I think long-term ways to help is be engaged these issues are complicated. Getting media to cover a story on Snap or something else is harder than you would think, right? And for me to talk about an issue takes way longer than it does to say, we're doing a grocery giveaway this weekend, right? And so everyone thinks that's how you solve the problem. But educate yourself. You can go to our website and learn a ton. A stat that I give that I have to clarify after I give it, but so 90 4% of the food safety net in our state and every other state in the country is federal dollars. 6% is charity. That 6% is crucial, right? Because it's very flexible. You don't have to fit in these boxes, et cetera. Very responsive. But without the 94%, that 6% is not putting a dent in anything. So we need to recognize where the resources are and stop shaming them or looking at them as not necessary or the first thing we can cut. And the only way we can do that is by talking to our elected officials and letting them know that we support these programs and that we think they're crucial, right? Not that people are mooching off me because that is not the case, right? These are folks in need. Most of them work. The vast majority of them who can work do work. We just have a system that doesn't pay people enough for them to really meet their basic needs if they're in certain types of jobs. And so I would say that's another big way. And being willing to think about the the more complicated issue rather than the immediate gratification that doing a canned food drive does. Canned food drives are good. I'm not ripping on that, right? But we need to recognize the issue for how nuanced and complicated it is and hold our decision makers accountable when they attack them because they think no one cares. You mentioned a lot of ways people can help. How can they uh, connect with you and your organization? So if they do want to find out more info. So uh, website is hungerfreeok.org. We have launched quite a few different portions of that website during COVID-19. If you want to support Tulsa Kitchens Unite, it's hungerfreeok.org forward slash Tulsa Kitchens Unite. You can learn about all the flexibilities in the federal programs. And even we have an online guide that'll walk you through SNAP enrollment if you've seen your hours cut or something. And that's hungerfreeok.org forward slash 
COVID-19 forward slash groceries, I believe. It's hard for me to remember all these websites, but if you go to hungerfreeok.org forward slash COVID-19, there are links to all of these different places. Yes, it is, uh, is hungerfreeoklahoma.org slash COVID-19, and then a link that takes you to the SNAP apply page. Thank you. See? Which, which, which we will put in, uh, in the, the episode notes. Yeah. I would also say this is going to be a shameless plug, which I'm not good at because I'm not quite your typical plug, plug, executive plug, director, plug. I've been told. But you can donate to us. We appreciate it. We are, we do not get individual donations the way a lot of other organizations do because our work's very heady and people don't want to think about it. But I often like to say dollars that go to us. So my annual budget until recently was under a million dollars a year. It's now just over a million dollars. And since we've started, we can look at the federal resources that have come in and say that it's over $35 million annually that's coming back to the state is either a direct or indirect result of the work of our partnerships that we built and the collaborations we built. I don't like to say because of us, because there are whole lots of groups that are responsible for that, right? But that's the type of work it takes to make lasting change is a whole lot of partners doing a whole lot. And we can't support our partners and help them focus on long-term vision unless we're funded. So, One thing that I'm hearing is that if you want to feel smart, you should donate to yeah. this organization. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, if that's how you want to frame it. Um, Listen, uh, in, in the world of podcasts about philanthropy and doing good works, I would say our audience is pretty heady. So, okay. yeah. Knowing so, the people who listen. Yeah. yeah. It, we're about systems change, right? Which is yeah. not always the fastest moving, but it's the longest lasting if you do it right. So I'd like to say if we've done our work right and we've created these changes in systems, they're bringing in this $35 million annually. In theory, if my entire organization went away tomorrow, those gains would last in perpetuity because we've mm -hmm. built that out. That's so the big. longer we can work on building those systems out, the more lasting change we can create. Well, one of the things we've talked about with some previous guests is that systems are rarely broken. They usually do what they were designed to do. It's just they're not doing what we want them to do. And yeah. so that's why having somebody who's willing to work on systems is so critical because if you're not working on the system, you're just working on the symptoms. Yeah, and systems are self-perpetuating, right, and self-preserving. Mm -hmm. So when I used to do work on prison systems, they are designed to continue to build themselves. They weren't in necessarily intentionally designed that way, but once you built the system, it's going to try and perpetuate itself. Mm -hmm. And we have built a system in our nutrition programs that is more designed to make sure that people we've said aren't deserving don't access them than they are designed to the people who need them so one of the ironies i like to talk about is the people who complain about bureaucracy and how you know there's so much government red tape are the ones who are so concerned that undeserving people will access government benefits that they create a bunch of bureaucracy and red tape mm -hmm. to make sure that doesn't happen right? i know it's 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 always funny to me because the the cost of making sure undeserving people don't access the service is usually greater than the cost of if some undeserving people access the service. Right. But the, then you have to deal with the moral who's deserving and who's not, right? Yeah. I don't like to make that. No. But you're absolutely right. Whoever you decide you want to exclude, typically the checks you have to put in place and the number of government people you have to put in place and hire to make those checks costs you way more than the money you save by keeping those people out. Right. The, yeah, I would the say good example you, you, is the no, drug yeah. testing related to in, in a lot of this, I think it was in Florida, the cost to implement that drug testing was significantly greater than the supposed savings of the people who were, who were kicked out of the program. Yeah. My, my favorite example is, is insurance, is health insurance, which is that the reason why Medicare costs less than private insurance is because private insurance has to pay people to find, you know, to process or to process and then deny claims 
than just accepting those claims. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, whenever we can point out it's not always government's fault, I like to I like to throw that in there. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Liberals. I think we're, anyway, I think we're running we're running up to the end of this, but one of the the last two things we like to do is just is there Normally, we would ask if there are any events that you want to plug. Obviously, things are a little <laughs> different right now. But I miss events. Yes. So we have talked about, you know, that there are ways they can connect. But are there any things that you'd like to plug, specifics that we haven't really talked about? Just kind of a last chance to throw anything out there. I mean, hey, follow us on social media because we actually put a lot of heady policy stuff out. We do some light, fluffy stuff, too, because you can't not do that in social media. But <laughs> You can learn a lot from us. I also think, you know, there's going to be opportunities as it opens up for people to volunteer at our partner organizations, which has not been true. And I can speak as somebody who sat on a task force to write a document for nonprofits as they reopen, that a lot of thoughts gone into keeping people safe when they do that. And so, you know, if you're not a part of a vulnerable population, I'd really, and you've never volunteered, you should think about doing it because it's, it's needed and it's going to continue to be needed. That is a really good point because a lot of just having worked with a lot of organizations, I would say a high percentage of the volunteers that get leaned on are people in vulnerable populations. You know, a lot of, a lot of volunteers are older because they're retired. So these organizations are going to need people who haven't volunteered before. Yeah. And I, the last thing I would say is right now, everyone in DC is supportive of they've voted for expanding snap potentially, right. And putting more money towards it and putting more money towards these child nutrition programs and removing barriers and it's going to be up to all of us to remind them when the crisis, you know, doesn't seem as bad to them that they support it then and that the need hasn't changed and people still need access to those programs. I'd also say for any of our listeners who are Leadership Tulsa, either members or alumni, you are also talking this Friday morning as part of their coffee chat series. Is that correct? Am I? Oh, Michelle's doing that one. Okay. I will be so driving sure. a van uh, <laughs> delivering meals. All right. But if if you have listeners who are members of the Center for Nonprofits, I am doing their coffee talk on Wednesday. All right. Uh, well, this, this, this will come out a day later. So if the oh, okay. Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits streams theirs in any way or saves them or wants to turn them in the podcast, they know exactly who to talk to. And that's um, the other way you can help. Invite us to talk to groups because that's really – the more people we can educate, the you know the more impactful we can be. So. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right. So the last thing we do normally in before the, the weirds as a, a podcast I listen to likes to call our current period, we would have had you in my, in my house, in my studio, in my nerd cave. And we would ask you to look around and to sort of pick out something that calls to you or that you have questions about. Can you but move the, what, can you move the camera yeah, around? I could move the camera around, but Honestly, I, I like I like our new question, which is where we ask our guests like what's their what's their favorite nerdum, and then we figure out if if I have something of that particular genre. So okay. when you're not when you're not doing two full time jobs trying to help uh, <laughs> uh, fix you know hunger issues in Oklahoma, what do you like to binge? What do you like to read? What do you like to play? And we'll see um, if I have something. So I have two small children, so my own hobbies have gone by the wayside. But <laughs> I was I was a big X Men nerd when I was a kid. Oh. Kids have gotten very into Marvel comics, so we nerd out on Lego Marvel stuff and Marvel movies and the I forget what the game is, but whatever that kind of battle game is for Marvel that you can get on your phone and your iPad. My kids make me play it so I can earn more characters for them to see. Oh yeah. Oh, All right. Yeah. Well, hold hold on one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring two things over and then we'll we will end this thing. Hold on. Yeah, they've they've created a bunch of different versions of basically that game. There's a Star Wars version. There's like a Disney version. My wife has been playing a Looney Tunes version of it. Oh, it's wow. all basically the same thing. Like Battle Arena, you earn points to get more characters. That yeah. You build up those characters so that you can do more battles and. 
at every. It's yeah. really hard to put earbuds back in with one hand. So first thing is the Marvel first set of movies. Like, oh, dude! Uh, from from Iron Man to the Avengers in the suitcase that has the Tesseract inside that lights yeah. up. Oh, so there. Yeah, like here's the. It's it's pretty cool. Like it's got it's got wow. lots of cool things inside. Wow. Um, yeah. That is legit. A, I don't think I've seen that before, Jesse. Oh yeah, it's an unnecessarily large thing that we have in our house now. Um, <laughs> the second one is the the circle that uh, you know, Star Lord gets at the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't know where that one is, but I also have these my two one of my two favorite Funko Pops. I've got <laughs> oh nice Magneto nice. And, and Professor X. Yes, yes. so. My kids got the pops. They had an advent calendar that every day you got a new Marvel character pop. Oh, no, nice. I've, I've seen that. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. cool. And we were not smart and we only got one. So every morning was a fight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. So which of the, so what we normally do is normally you would take a picture with one of those. So instead, okay. it, I think Jesse's been just taking a picture of it next to a picture of the guests uh, of you yes if if you have a marvel related thing and you would like to take a picture of a, of a selfie with it and send it to me that also that would be works. greatly appreciated yeah yes. that would also work so if I you want to take that. a picture with one of your funko pops or anything else that'll work too yeah we can do that all right well thank again thank you so much i know you are incredibly busy right mm-hmm. now you're transitioning from your new day job to your old day job uh <laughs> You know, chugging down that rock star I saw. Yeah, the for yeah the rest of your that's day. the old habit that I picked back up during the crisis. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, I'm I'm constantly it's, it's a constant set of uppers and downers uh, <laughs> during this time. So, well, thank you so much for joining us, thank and you. we'll make sure to list all those links and uh, places to volunteer and donate in our show notes. And again, just thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you guys. I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you all again for listening to this episode of Pod for Good. Please do what you can to help out Hunger Free Oklahoma and their local partners help people eat during this very, very stressful time. And remember, you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. And if you so desire, you can please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget, get it done, Tulsa. Tulsa.